Dear Vice President Castaldo, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, friends, students, and families who are assembled here in this magnificent room or who are participating in this ceremony from remote. On 15 August 2020, <clears throat> our dear friend and colleague Josip Kreger, a highly respected professor of sociology of law and former dean of the Zagreb Law Faculty, suddenly passed away. For many years, Josip Kreger represented the University of Zagreb in the European Master in Human Rights and Democratization, as well as in the board of EUC, the predecessor of the Global Campus of Human Rights. Josip was a highly respected moral authority in Croatia who always stood up for human rights and against corruption. We are sadly missing him and his presence and his sense of humor during today's ceremony and will always remember him as an inspiring teacher and a great human being. May I kindly ask you to rise for a minute of silence in memory of Josip Greger. Thank you. May you live in interesting times was the motto of last year's Art Biennale in Venice. <clears throat> I do not know whether the curators had already foreseen the challenges which we are all facing during the COVID-19 pandemic, but we can certainly agree that we are living in highly interesting and extraordinary times. By applying a human rights-based approach to the COVID-19 pandemic, we view it as a conflict between different human rights, which, as any other human rights conflict, needs to be solved by balancing these human rights in accordance with the principle of proportionality. So on the one hand, COVID-19 is a highly infectious and deadly disease which threatens the rights to life and health of many millions of human beings. Worldwide, more than one million have already lost their lives due to COVID-19, most of them in the United States, Brazil, India, Mexico, and the United Kingdom. And Italy, and in particular, the northern regions of Lombardia and Veneto, was one of the first countries to be affected and quickly uh, drifted into a tragic health emergency with overcrowded hospitals, lack of intensive care facilities, and the loss of more than 36,000 lives. In such a situation, governments and the international community have an obligation under international human rights law to take all necessary measures that can reasonably be expected from them in order to protect and fulfill the right to life, and the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, including the prevention, treatment, and control of epidemic diseases. If we compare the death rates in different countries around the globe, we see that those governments, which in recent years and decades, due to neoliberal economic policies, had drastically reduced the budgets for public health social security and social welfare were much less able to comply with their international human rights obligations and to protect their own people against this deadly virus. Those states which had still maintained a fairly well-functioning public health and social welfare system usually were much better prepared to deal with this pandemic. A second lesson which we can draw from COVID-19 is that states which are governed by populist and authoritarian leaders, who often even deny the dangers of this pandemic, are usually less effective in dealing with this disease than states where democratic structures with effective checks and balances are still functioning and where governments prefer to follow the advice of health experts rather than being guided by opinion polls and fake news. We also see that many people prefer to turn to quality media as public radio and television stations rather than informing themselves through the tabloid press and social media. 
In order to protect the rights to life and health, governments were forced to interfere with many other human rights, including the rights to personal liberty, freedom of movement, privacy and data protection, freedom of assembly, the rights to work and education. In fact, many of us experienced more severe restrictions in the daily exercise of our most cherished human rights than ever before. In principle, most of these restrictions can be justified by applying the principle of proportionality in accordance with the respective limitation clauses in international human rights treaties for the protection of public health and the right to life, particularly of vulnerable groups, without any need to declare a public emergency. On the other hand, there are also many cases where authoritarian governments used the COVID-19 pandemic as an excuse to expand their powers, unduly control the privacy of their citizens, and thereby undermining human rights, the rule of law, and democratic principles. An important lesson from these restrictions is that the lockdown revealed and further exacerbated extreme economic and social inequalities in our contemporary societies. While privileged people could even enjoy the positive side of spending more time with their families in their spacious home offices, the disadvantaged segments of our societies were most severely affected the poor, the homeless, slum dwellers, the elderly in nursing and old people's homes, school children, minorities, refugees, migrants, prisoners and detainees, among others. To conclude my reflections on COVID-19 on a more positive and forward-looking note, we need to learn the lessons from this pandemic by doing the opposite of what neoliberal economists and populist politicians have told us for decades. It is more than obvious that global markets are not able to solve global crises, whether pandemics, financial or climate crises. Instead of minimizing the role of the state, we need strong and democratic states with courageous political leaders who take their international human rights obligations seriously by strengthening rather than weakening public health, social security, social welfare, and other services required by economic, social, and cultural rights. We need governments and international organizations that are willing to regulate and restrict global markets for the purpose of redistributing wealth, supporting marginalized groups, establishing social justice, and reducing economic inequalities. We need strong and democratic states to strengthen quality media and public broadcasting. Rather than falling back into nationalism and weakening the World Health Organization, the United Nations, the European Union, and other international organizations, we need to strengthen multilateralism and international solidarity in order to cope effectively with the enormous global challenges of the 21st century. I believe the European Union is best placed to take a lead in changing this dynamic. Finally, COVID-19 illustrated that it is possible to lock down the global economy to a considerable extent in order to combat a global health pandemic. The European Union has also shown that it is possible to find 750 billion euros to mitigate some of the worst effects of this lockdown and to support the recovery of the economy. If the EU, its member states and other governments would be equally determined to take similarly drastic measures to combat climate change and other environmental disasters, we could still prevent some of the irreversible damages to our planet and the rights of our children and future generations. Let us understand COVID-19 as a signal to radically change our current economic and political structures and as an opportunity to revive our social contract and to establish a new global solidarity based on universal human rights rather than capitalist greed, uh, egoism and nationalism. 
as graduates of the EMA program, you are joining not only the EMA Alumni Association, you are also members of a network of more than 4,000 global campus alumni, a fascinating group of professional human rights defenders active in governments, intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, in courts, national human rights institutions, the corporate sector, media, arts, academia, and other segments of civil society in all regions and corners of our planet. You are our global campus ambassadors. You are the future agents of change. History teaches us that all major human rights movements, revolutions, and achievements had their origin in the suffering of human beings during times of crisis. Use the current pandemic as a starting point to turn our world into a better place to live in. COVID-19 also brought other major challenges for the global campus of human rights and our seven master programs in all world regions. It is very difficult to plan any events in person today. And all stakeholders involved need to be extremely flexible. The management of the global campus, our external partners, above all the European Union and the Right Livelihood Foundation. Our professors, teachers, staff, and most of all our students. We all had to move to online teaching and learning, to online conferences and meetings, to managing our day-to-day -day activities from home offices and other remote locations. I'm extremely grateful to our students who were often stranded in remote locations without access to libraries or other research facilities for showing so much patience, understanding, and flexibility to adapt to new learning experiences. I wish to wholeheartedly congratulate you for having mastered all these challenges, for having written excellent master theses under these extreme circumstances, and for having successfully concluded the European Master in Human Rights and Democratization. I'm sure that you will never forget the hardship you had to go through, but also the relief and satisfaction of having finally succeeded. I'm happy that so many of you and your families were able to come to Venice to celebrate this remarkable success, together with us here at the Scuola Grande, and to so those of you who were not able to come to Venice, I'm equally happy to know that you are an essential part of this ceremony via the live stream. You're most cordially invited to join us during our next ceremony in 2021. Unfortunately, the incoming students cannot be with us today due to COVID-19 related space restrictions in the Scuola Grande di San Rocco. But they are following our inauguration ceremony from remote. In order to comply with the physical distancing requirements in our monastery, we had to reduce the number of new students from 90 to 67. Although some of them are still in quarantine, we're extremely happy and proud that unlike many other master programs, most students of the new EMA generation actually arrived during the last weeks in Venice and are being taught in person. To ensure that all necessary health requirements are strictly complied with, in practice is a veritable challenge for all our students, teachers and staff. I had already the pleasure to hold an outdoor class with our new students and was very encouraged by their enthusiasm, discipline and positive spirit. Let me wish you a successful, happy, rewarding and memorable experience of togetherness in these extraordinary times. Finally, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to the entire EMA team, the EMA governing bodies, the various global campus support units in Venice, our teachers and professors and our graduating and inaugurating students, who all proved that if we stand together in the spirit of solidarity, we are a strong academic community prepared to master the challenges of a global pandemic. 
Last but not least, I wish to thank Maria Lauer Biccio Folati for allowing us to use these beautiful facilities of the Scuola Grande di San Rocco, even in times of COVID-19 restrictions. I'm also very grateful to our interpreter Veneziani for the beautiful music, Gianluca Costantini for enriching this ceremony with the portraits of human rights defenders, uh, Alexander Repenning from the Right Livelihood Foundation for a mutually enriching partnership, and for announcing today the Right Livelihood Laureates for 2020, and the Vice President of the European Parliament in charge of human rights, Fabio Massimo Castaldo, to find the time under these extraordinary circumstances to deliver a keynote speech to our students and guests. I thank you for your attention.